you know, there's you know the goldfish myth um, yeah. that our attention spans have shrunken as, uh, to the you know, being shorter than those of goldfish. And um, you know, as we talked, there there really is no evidence of that whatsoever. Um, that was actually like literally a made up <laughs> fictional piece of data. What will you do to unlock innovation? In today's fast-paced world, innovation might not be enough. Tomorrow's pioneers of change will need to be agile, able to adapt, and committed like never before. Your host, Santa Vending, invites you to listen in and join business leaders from around the world as they share their visions for success in our future business challenges. Welcome to Mind Innovation. I'm your host, Santa Vending, and I'm thrilled to have Chris Gray join us today. Chris is a renowned expert in bias technology and purchase behavior and with over two decades of experience studying and understanding what drives consumer decisions. He observed and interviewed thousands of customers across a wide range of product categories. And today we'll be discussing myth, interest technology, and also the importance of critical thinking. So, uh, so let's, let's dive into it, Chris. I'm, I'm excited again. You're actually coming back on the show. So I'm so excited because we have yeah. so much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, Santa. Yeah, I'm so glad uh, to be back on the show. Um, not only did we have a blast last time, but it also means that it, I must have brought some value to your listeners. So I'm very happy about that. And Definitely. It's great to be with Definitely. Yeah, no, and, and there's so much on it, right, in this topic. So, so again, right, that just to lead into to, to the first question that I have is, you know, so why is bias technology, you know, why is it important for companies? Yeah, so um, buyer psychology or consumer psychology, um, you know, when we think about it in the world of business, you know, marketing, sales, uh, innovation, the reason it's so important is because, you know, there's so many different ways that you can go about reaching out to your customers, innovating for your customers. But if you are not doing it in a way that is relevant and meaningful and motivating to them, then it's not going to be very effective. And so consumer psychology is the study of how consumers make decisions, what drives their buying, per their purchase behavior, um, and looking at things like emotion and cognition and motivation and social psychology. Those all play into it. And so when you understand and you have a deep understanding of your customer, then that allows you to understand what's going to be relevant to them, what's going to motivate them and drive their decision making. And it gives you an opportunity to influence them. And as I like to say, influence them without feeling gross about it. Yeah. Uh, because when you really understand your customer and their needs, you don't have to be manipulative because you can provide to them what they're looking for in a way that is better, faster, or more enjoyable than your competition. And that's really the ultimate goal of consumer psychology is to drive that buying behavior in a way that helps everyone win. Yeah. So is there anything going on right now in trending or, you know, after or with, you know, with pandemic, right? Three years after and we're still in a new kind of world. Um, has, has some of these behavior, have, have has there been some changes? You know, I think there, there have been some changes. I think, you know, it's one of the things that when we're in the very, you know, the very depths of the pandemic and, you know, people were not able to leave their homes and were, we had to order everything online and have things delivered to us. And there was a lot of talk about, well, consumers are never going back to in-store shopping ever again. And, you know, after 25 years of this, I've learned to take a lot of those with it, with a grain of salt. Um, yeah. And it has really, you know, that, that has really proven true. Um, you know, when people adapt or adopt behaviors um, during a time of crisis, uh, they tend to, to re return to those previous behaviors unless the new behavior really provides some additional value yeah. above and beyond. And certainly, it, you know, we can say that uh, there has been an uptick in, you know, shopping online and having things delivered, um, I, you know, would be out of my mind to say otherwise. But we are also seeing um, a return to shopping behavior in stores as well. And I think that there's uh, opportunity for both. Yeah. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of interesting hybrid models there as well. And so I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic, knock on wood, um, there is, I think, a yearning for connection, for getting out and being with people um, that we missed for so long. And yeah. so I think we're starting to see that uh, in, all, in the way we shop as well as, you know, I, you know, I went to a, I went to a movie theater uh, last yeah. weekend for the first time in a long time and it was packed and it yeah. was the blast. And it just, yeah. 
reminded me how much fun that can be. And I think that there's a lot of that kind of returning to those things that we love. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I want So I love Target. I have to say that. But I also love that I can order online and drive up and say, I'm here because then I won't buy all the extra stuff. If I go <laughs> in and to a Target, I know I will buy some extra stuff. So if I'm saying, let me not spend the extra money, I will actually use the feature where it's just saying, right, let's just um, let's order online. And then you put all the cat litter that I don't want to lift. <laughs> right. <laughs> my car. Exactly. And I think that, that those kind of interesting hybrid models are yeah. really taking yeah. Um, and what's great about that is I think for so long, we kind of, there was a sense of pitting online versus in-store, um, yeah. like had one or the other had to win. And I think what we're seeing is that uh, there's room for both and yeah. they actually often work very well together. Yeah. No, definitely. What about, so I want to talk about the movie theater because I like that because I talked to a friend the other day where we were like, oh my God, right? Our attention, right? If I sit on the couch at home and watch a movie, my phone is almost in my hand, right? And it's like, how many seconds or minutes can it be on the table if I leave it? Or do I really need to check something else, right? So that my yeah. attention span. But yeah. if you go to the movie theater, I'm like, I put it on silent. I respect it. I put it away and I actually enjoy the whole movie. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk yeah. about the attention span here. So attention. Yeah. I and mean, I know last yeah. time we talked a little bit about attention as well, but I think um, that uh, it is such an interesting and uh, in-depth topic that we can kind of spend a little bit more time with it as well. But yeah, you know, uh, one of the things that when it comes to attention, I think that is important for people to understand is that our attention spans um, have not really um depleted, like our capability, our, our capacity for attention uh, has not really depleted. What instead what's happened is there's just more things trying to get our attention right now. Um, and so that makes it very challenging. And so, yeah, you know, going to a theater, actually the theater that I went to, they actually at the beginning, not only did they say no talking or texting or being on your phone, they said, we will actually kick you out yeah. if you're on your phone. Yeah. And I was like, wow, all right, here we go. You know? And there is something just really enjoyable about tuning everything else out and just focusing on, in this case, you know, a movie, yeah. um, but it could be a conversation with a friend. It could be um, the work that you're doing. There is something that is kind of refreshing these days to not have a zillion different things kind of vying for your attention at the same time. And, you know, there's, uh, we talked last time about, you know, the goldfish myth um, yeah. that our attention spans have shrunken as, uh, to the, you know, being shorter than those of goldfish. And, um, you know, as we talked, there, there really is no evidence of that whatsoever. Um, that was actually like literally a made up <laughs> fictional piece of data. Um, and, you know, when you think about that movie experience, like I didn't have any problem like engrossing yeah. myself in the show yeah. because I didn't have anything else to distract me. And so I think, you know, when we think about this from a business or a marketing standpoint, um, it's interesting to me that that goldfish myth just continues. I mean, I spoke at a conference uh, about a month ago and we was talking about myth busting and that one came up and someone said, you know, the speaker before you just brought that up as you one did. other point. So like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it just shows up everywhere. I mean, it's, um, you know, you killed it. No, <laughs> I know. I, I wish I could. It's like the zombie myth here. It just keeps coming back. It's like it's in USA, Today, USA Today. I was really disheartened to see it uh, pop up in the New York Times. Yeah. And I saw it in Ted Lasso, right? I yes, was the recent Ted Lasso where there. they talked about yeah. it as well. And it, I, you know, so part of me starts to think, well, why is it so pervasive? You know, why yeah. does it keep coming back? And I think, there is something from a business or from a marketing standpoint anyway, um, that when we say, you know, our attention spans have, are depleted and yeah. me as a marketer, like, what can I do about it? I only have eight seconds. So, you know, what can I possibly do in eight seconds? But if we say, no, it's not that they're depleted. It's just that there's so many more things competing for attention. Yeah. Then I, as a marketer have to think, wow, I have really better be on my game. The yeah. onus shifts to me. And I think there's a little bit of that, like trying to shift that responsibility away that keeps this going. Um, plus, it's just an interesting sort of like clickbait. It is. Yeah. Right. Time, yeah. right? But, um, you know, when it comes to attention that um, we tend to pay attention to those things that are most relevant to us in any given moment. And so 
if we are trying to get someone's attention, we have to understand what is relevant to that person. You know, what do they care about? What is uh, important to them? What will be motivating to them and what will engage them? Yeah. And that requires empathy. Um, because if I just talk to you about the things that are interesting to me and has no interest to you, you're going to be looking at your phone. You're going to be like staring off into space. You're going to be looking for anything interesting, yeah. um, to pay attention to. But if I know, um, some of the things that are interesting to you, um, and what's important to you, and we can have a conversation where we're talking about that as well, then it becomes much more engaging. And I think that's really an important factor when it comes to gaining attention. It's also uh, you know, one of the m most important reasons for uh, consumer psychology is because we really do focus on understanding what's going on with our consumers. Yeah. Okay, next one we need to talk about, right? Because I had one where I could not find, right, the source for this one. Yes. So that was that it, it was like, you know, that our brains process visual faster than text. Yeah. Uh, and I had one where I think it says like 90% of the information our brain process is visual. Right. And I gave it to you so you could give it to me. And of course, yeah. because I'm, you know, I, I myth busting. So and critical thinking is like a thing for me. I had to like go follow and see like, OK, where is this coming from? Everything. And as we talked about, you know, it's like I clicked on the link that had that. And that just took me to another set of statistics. Yeah. And to another one. And then the trail just ended and there was no actual source listed for it. So yeah. that may or may not be true. Um, yeah. I haven't seen that specific statistic. Um, it, it sounds kind of intuitively correct, but um, I do know that, you know, we actually do process um, imagery much more quickly than we do text. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, and, and I do have some background for this, um, there by some measures, we process uh, imagery 60,000 times faster than text. Yeah. And uh, it, it, we can process an image as quickly as 13 milliseconds, um, which you say a word like you say a term like 13 milliseconds. It's really hard to wrap your head around, but that's actually faster than the blink of an eye. Yeah. Um, and so you know, think about how quickly uh, we can really process information and communicate information. Right. If you're really yeah. if you're trying to communicate, particularly if you're in a competitive situation where you know, a sales situation, marketing situation, um, you want to be able to communicate very quickly. Yeah. Um, you want to be able to communicate more quickly than your competition because you get that sort of first mover advantage there, right? Um, and so, you know, it is really uh, an important thing to consider uh, imagery uh, when you are communicating. I think the challenge uh, that also needs to be need to keep in mind is that uh, when we process imagery, uh, and we do it so quickly. That is uh, what's known as a system one type of processing, which just a little bit of background. Um, Daniel Kahneman, psychologist, he came up with this, this uh, way of thinking about how we think and how we process information. And there's really two sides of a coin here. One is system one, which he calls, which is instantaneous, um, very fast. It's intuitive. It's usually subconscious. Like we're not even aware we're processing it you know, 13 milliseconds, and we're not going to be yeah. aware, right? I'm still standing uh, blinking just to, you know, get the right. <laughs> speed. I know, every time I'm like, okay, there's another one. Yeah, I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that's, you know, really fast. And, and so you yeah. think about, um, you know, we say like someone's on autopilot or sometimes when we're, you know, the number of things that we do in our brains that we're not even aware of are often the system one that's just instantly taking over so that our brains don't have to go through all those choices and decisions and processing consciously because we, yeah. we would become, you know, frozen. Um, and then there's system two, which is more of when you think about concentrating, right? So it's more, um, you know, deliberate, um, logical, um, you know, very um, uh, conscious thinking. So and usually that's when we're in a situation where something new or novel or difficult, you know, sort of thing to figure out. That's us really, when you have, when you sit down, like, I really need to think about that, that's system two. Okay. That's the background. So the problem with system one, and I would say that when we process an image in, you know, a few milliseconds, that is very much system one intuitive subconscious thinking. The challenge with it is that it is often, um, it, it's very capable of making errors. 
because it happens so quickly uh, and because we're not being very conscious of it, um, it is prone to error. And so that's where biases come in um, and things like that, which uh, we've talked about before. Yeah. Um, and so we have to be careful. They, they do process very quickly um, and that's an advantage, but we also have to be very um, thoughtful about the imagery we use because it can be influ influenced by so many different things. The context in which that image um, shows up, the um, manner in which uh, it's drawn or the, the photography or what, what have it, any little element might throw someone off. And so we really have to think about um, and be careful about the image that we're using. And if you remember a few years ago, um, there's a big uh, to do about the, the, is the dress blue or is it, oh, is yeah. it old, yeah. right? I mean, people process things differently <laughs> in different situations. Yeah. And it just gives you a sense of like how different, different people can uh, yeah. really process or interpret an image. And so while I would definitely say, you know, imagery is a big positive, it also comes with some caveats of we have to be very intentional. Um, and, and again, understand our audience, because how, how I might think of an image might be very different than the audience that I'm speaking to. And that can get you into a lot of trouble um, and create a lot of mis miscommunication if you're not careful. Yeah. What, what about, I think, you, again, right now that I gave you that link, right? Um, oh, yeah. That was like uh, using the, the critical thinking. Uh, yes. And back to the goldfish <laughs> as well, right? You right. know, saying, you know, question to yourself and saying, yeah, this is what I see, you know, do I believe everything I actually, you know, see on, if it's on the TV, or it's on a computer, right? Or it's from your phone, you know, yeah. the critical thinking aspect here is, is so important as well that, that we, we have that. Yeah. And I think, you know, <clears throat> it's something I'm very passionate about. I, um, sometimes, you know, uh, my background as a psychologist is a little infuriating sometimes <clears throat> because um, yeah, what I know it? a lot about no. psychology. <laughs> and when I see, <laughs> when I, you know, when I see someone who doesn't have a lot of background talking about things that, you know, in, in, in whether intentionally or unintentionally, it's usually unintentionally kind of spreading misinformation. It, it's frustrating. And so I really feel strongly about, you know, critical thinking and, yeah. you know, have people really, uh, when you're taking in new information, be able to assess it. Um, where is this coming from? Is it uh, from a valid source? Is it from a you know an actual study? Is it something someone made up, like the goldfish? Yeah. Um, you know, really being able to take in new information, assess it, and then be able to set aside the parts of it that may or may not be true. That may not be true. And then incorporate new information to change the way that we think. And I think that's an important part of critical thinking as well, um, is the ability to, when something, uh, when new information comes in that is different than we thought, yeah, to be able to adjust the way that we think. And that is very challenging because it does require a lot of humility on our parts to be able to do that. And I think we see you know, a, a lot of challenges with that in society today. No, it's it definitely, and it, it's an important skill to to, to have. Um, something else I want to touch it is like company culture or the culture, right? So if you have different teams and you you work, you know, of course, with your customers, um, when do you? How do you, you? How do you get you know the the trust to to you know to 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 build on you? Or how do you how do you get the trust from from these customers if you don't have the product maybe um, or you know, how, how do you build it? If you have any experience? Yeah, right. The, the first, first and foremost, it is really, um, authenticity, honesty. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I'm frequently asked as a consumer psychologist is, you know, don't you just trick people into buying things they don't want? Um, and I, I, I actually love that question now, um, used to bother me, but um, because my point is you, you, you can do that. There's plenty yeah. of ways you can trick customers to buying something, but at the end of the day, it is about building trust. It is about being honest and thinking about the customer and their needs. And yeah. so, you know, we were talking earlier and, um, if a customer comes to you and has a need that you can't fill, there's actually, um, research out there that if you are, you send them to a competitor and say, look, this isn't something that we do, or maybe we don't have this or we're 
it's out of stock or what have you. Um, but I know that if you go here, this company or this brand, they'll do it right. And they, they have what you need. And, and that's great. What, what tends to happen is that builds trust. Yeah. That builds affinity. That gives a customer the sense that you are looking out for them and you are attuned to their needs versus just trying to push your business or your product onto them. Yeah. And uh, there's e- even research that shows that when brands, com- a competitive brand complements its competitors, um, you know, so let's say, you know, Diet Coke says, hey, you know, Diet Pepsi's got it going on. They know what they're doing, you know, whatever. Um, that that actually increases yeah. the affinity for the brand making the compliment much more than for the brand receiving the compliment. And I just thought that's a neat little uh, bit of research that um, that tells us, you know, it really is important to be honest and to be thinking about the consumer first yeah. um, and making sure they're getting their needs met. At the end of the day, what, what do customers want? I mean, they may love your brand, but they want honesty. They want to know, um, can you do this for me or not? Or can you help me get there? And, you know, they want to have their needs met first and foremost. Uh, and so by helping them do that, you win every time. Yeah. I, I want to pivot or maybe it's in the same because let's touch about communities, right? Because I think if you look at your, <clears throat> of your audience um, and it can be, you know, whatever you sell, right? Or you, you promote. Um, I've seen a lot of communities pop up and people love it. Some people do. Mm-hmm. Um, so is that, I'm sure it's always been there. I don't, I'm sure it's not new. Maybe it's just a new way right now. What I'm seeing is that it's it's more accessible um, to be part of these different communities. If it's for me, you know, it could be a marketing community, right? It could be mm-hmm. uh, innovation, right? Or mm-hmm. it could be a product that I like um, and then I get my coupons. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, yeah. there's a great old saying and it's something I wish I would have said, but I didn't, um, that people don't, like people don't buy brands, they join them. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a great way to think about um, your brand or your business, your service as as a community and that people want to join that community if you are meeting their needs, if you are being authentic, if you are um, you know, appealing to them. Yeah. And when you develop that, that's that's gold because, you know, the having customers who are not only um feel strongly and emotionally engaged with your brand. I was going to say loyalty, but I am not a big fan of, of loyalty thinking. Um, <clears throat> but when they have an emotional connection with your brand, when they feel like your brand is uh, reliable and they can relate to it and is looking out for them, um, they also can be advocates for your brand. Yeah. Uh, and that is, that is gold for brands because it's like what I like to call that is it, it's a resilient relationship. And <clears throat> when you have, when you build resilient, resilient relationships with your customers, the great thing for brands around that is that they tend to be not only long lasting, but also durable um, and forgiving. Yeah. And so you know, like, like people, brands make mistakes. Um, and when you have that kind of relationship, that resilient relationship with your customers, they're willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. Okay. They got it wrong this time, but yeah. I'm, I feel confident that one, they'll make up for it if there's a need to do that and they'll get it right the next time. Um, yeah. And I think that is really valuable because what that then does is makes this a long-term relationship that a brand will benefit from for, for many years. Yeah, no, it's, it definitely. So any, any advice you want to give if somebody's you know, if starting out there and saying, okay, how do we, how do we start building this trust? How do you know, how do we, how do we start? Do we interview all our customers or, you know, how, how, do, how do they get off the ground? Well, there's a few things. And, you know, certainly, you know, there's a lot of different types of research you can do. You can spend a lot of money doing research. And, you know, I've done a lot of research myself. And, and that certainly is valuable. But if you're just starting out, that can feel really daunting. And it can feel like it's very expensive. Even though well, it pays off, yeah. it can be very expensive. Um, the first thing I would say is if you're... Um, you probably know more, you and your organization probably knows more than you would think or that you you think you do. Um, if you're the kind of company that's maybe selling a product or you've got salespeople, 
they're a great place to start because they're on the front lines. They're working with customers every day, um, whether that is you know in person or online. They are a virtual treasure trove. And it's one of the first places I go when I'm working with an organization um, is let's talk to your sales force because yeah. they know where the struggles are. They know what the needs are. They know where uh, your brand or your service is connecting and they know where it's not because they're the ones that have to deal with every time it does it. Yeah. And that's always a great place to start um, is, is internally look at what do we already know and then go from there. And how do we verify that? Um, because sometimes you think, you know, something and that's where, you know, bias can come in. Um, so it's always important to have a little bit of that humility of like, okay, we think this is the case. Yeah. Now, if I've got a whole team of salespeople telling me this, that's probably pretty good. But if it's just like, hey, we think this is what our customers' needs are. We think this is where a sticking point is or a pain point is for them, but we're not sure. That's when we need to do some validation to make sure that you are actually addressing the right needs and the right pain points for people. Yeah. No, that's good. I think I always, also customer service, right? Was, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Talk yeah. to anyone talk to that's them on the front line. Or, or sales. Yeah. Because that's, that's where you can see the pain. <laughs> and they're always happy to tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they, it's, you know, they deal with it all day and it's, it's yeah. important. You know, people want to feel acknowledged and they want to feel like someone's listening. And so, um, you know, if you've got a customer service team, take the time to listen to them. Um, not yeah. only is it um, good for them uh, and keeps them motivated and feel like someone's actually paying attention to what I'm doing yeah. and listening to what I have to say, but it will give you really valuable insights into customers. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um I have one more question and, and you're not prepared no. for this one. So let, let's, no, it's okay. out. Ooh, yeah, no, because I love, you know, all the myths, right? Uh, so I wanted, yeah. I wanted to hear here on the last one, you know, if you have one more, one more you could share. Oh boy. Um, yes, I have, there, there's so many, um, this is something that I do quite often. I, I, I speak at conferences a lot about myths and a workshop around myth busting and how to develop a myth busting mindset. Um, and the reason I do it is just because I think it's so important for us um, and for companies to be working with valid information, right? Yeah. And, you know, the more we are able to challenge uh, our thinking and develop it and uh, take it to the next level, the, the more effective companies are going to be, the better their sales, the more engagement they're going to have. Um, and so I, one I think that's really interesting that just popped up recently is um, there's for years, uh, I think back in like right around 2002 or so, a study came out about um, consumers and choice. And when you have consumers that are buying something, if they have the, so like a, a lot of choices, they tend to be unhappy and anxious about the choice and end up being unhappy with the purchase or they won't purchase at all. Uh, and that became known as choice overload. There was a book called The Paradox of Choice written by a psychologist named Barry Schwartz. And this blew up like crazy because the whole idea was you've got to reduce your choices so that yeah. you know people have fewer choices, but they'll, they're more likely to buy. They'll feel better about it. And that for you know decades was the, the primary thinking and retailers were trying to you know, streamline their, the options at, at shelf and brands were like, t you know, taking back items that, you know, taking them off the shelves because they wanted to have it streamlined. Well, just last year, uh, Barry Schwartz, the author of uh, The Paradox of Choice, actually uh, released a new study. And that study actually found that cho choice overload is not nearly as much of a problem as choice deprivation. Uh, hmm. People generally feel like they have too few choices. Um, and this was a huge study, like 7,000 people across multiple countries. And they found that not only did most, most people um, feel like they didn't have enough choices, they actually had, um, not having enough choices actually had a bigger impact on their sense of dissatisfaction of not being happy with their ultimate purchase. And so it kind of flipped everything on its head. Yeah. Um, but when you really dig into the study, and this is why you know, Barry Schwartz did a really nice job of explaining this, is it's not that there isn't choice overload. There is, but there you, it's very contextual. Um, and there are certain situations in which people feel like there's too many choices and that is appropriate. But most of the time, even in the U.S., where we have so many choices, it seems like in everything, 
um, primarily, overwhelmingly, actually, people either felt that they had just enough choices or not enough choices. Yeah. And uh, but there were two categories that they studied, categories of products they studied that choice overload really was an issue. Like there really just were too many choice. People just felt like there's just too much. Yeah. Yeah. Any guesses on what one of those might be? Breakfast. <laughs> That's a good one. Like, usually I have choice overload in the morning just so my brain isn't oh. working. <laughs> the real options on, yeah, no. <laughs> um, one of them was soft drinks. Okay. And the other one was uh, buying a house. Ah. And they seem like so different, right? And they actually are. But what they discovered was that um, for uh, soda, first of all, people expect an easy choice. They don't expect to be spending a yeah. ton of time, like having to go through and make choices about all these different varieties of soda. And the other part was there are so many different variations within a certain brand of soda that sometimes it felt like they weren't even that different. And so in that case, what they found was if a consumer can't intuitively and clearly understand the difference between the choices, then they felt choice overload because they weren't able to like, why is this one different than this one? And is this one better than this one? I don't know. I can't tell. So it's always important to manage choice and manage how you communicate the differences between your products. Yeah. Right. And for house buying, it's actually um, when a choice, when the choice is really complicated uh, and has a huge impact on people, that's when they start to feel overwhelmed as well uh, for very different reasons. And so in that case, it's uh, important that uh, we try to simplify as much as possible for, possible for people and help them determine the choices between these very complex things. Um, but I thought it was really fascinating. Um, we've been talking so much over the last two decades about, oh, you've got to limit your choices, limit your choices. Yeah. And what we found is like, yes, in some cases, yes, that's true. But for most people, either they feel like they have enough or uh, and more importantly, they feel like there's not enough choices. And so really the key here is people don't want less choice. They want well-managed choice so that it's easy for them to determine how these things are different. I can figure out which one's best for me because it's clearly communicated. And that really is the big important takeaway from this. So That's really interesting. interesting. Like yeah. It's been so pervasive in marketing and, and retail for so long yeah. uh, that I really, I, I love sharing that one because it really does kind of like people like, yeah, now we get more soda flavors again. No. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, it's really interesting. So like any cake time when someone's like, really, I'm expecting an easy choice and we just overload them, then yeah. that's going to be. Yeah. Go with water. No. Um, right. <laughs> uh, that, no, well, that's really like even in water now, you go yeah, down I water. Know, like, yeah. There's a whole aisle dedicated yeah. to bottled water. Wow. Right. Okay. Yeah, I saw a show that were like tasting all the different kinds of, of water as well. So that's a whole, yeah. Oh, yeah, let's not touch that one. So, right, right. <laughs> if anybody from the um, from the listener from Mind Innovation that want to reach out to you, how, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, so a couple of different ways. One, you can always go to my website, which is thebicologist.com. And um, you can uh, check me out. You can check out uh, what I do and my background and everything. Uh, and you can also, there's a form that you can fill out to get in touch with me if you're interested in having me speak or do a workshop. Uh, always happy to do that. Uh, and the other is um, something I'm trying out, which is um, I can uh, I'll give you a um, uh, addre a web address uh, and uh, people can go and let me know uh, what they thought about my uh, discussion here, our discussion here today. Um, and if you do that, it will ask you just some really simple questions about, you know, do you think it was informative or not? You know, get ask you to give some feedback. And if you do that, you'll get a bonus as well. And I, I'm, uh, one of the things when it comes to critical thinking, I always tell people, ask for sources. You know, if you ever question, is this true or not? Ask them where they're getting their information from. And my favorite question is, how do you know that? Right? It's like a yeah. power question right there. It is, yeah. Um, and so I'm going to give you, um, not only uh, some additional power questions, but a few of the sources that I used in my myth busting, um, the goldfish, uh, as well as the, the Barry Schwartz uh, choice deprivation study. Uh, I'll send you links to those as well. Awesome. And I, I'll make sure to put it on the, the episode on the link there as well. And also on mindinnovation.com on the page. Fantastic. I almost forgot uh, to get that bonus. You have to enter in a code and that code is SANA. S-A-N-N-A-H. Thank you for spelling my name right. No, <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that last time too. We were yeah. talking about 
uh, looking for your name on the soda cans. You're like, it's, yeah, my name's never on them. <laughs> yeah, it never will be. No, <laughs> this was a blast. I think it was so fun just, you know, talk about it. Be the critical thinking again, right? I think it's so important. And then when, when you see something pop up, um, and I love that we talked about the, the goldfish. And then when I was rewatching Ted Lasso with my kids, I was like, oh my God, there it is. <laughs> it's you know, like, it's really made, like there's been some really awkward moments when I'm speaking at conferences <laughs> where like, this, the speaker just before me, like brought it up and, you know, their presentation and I yeah. have to follow and be like, actually, no, you know, because like, that was part of my presentation already. <laughs> Even worse is when I'm before the person that's going to say that. Yeah. And you killed oh, it. All oh, sorts of awkward. Yeah. <laughs> no. So thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed it. I always have a blast talking to Santa. Thank you. If you like Mind Innovation, don't forget to subscribe, rate and share the show wherever you get your podcast. You can follow Senna Vinding and Mind Innovation on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And make sure to check out mindinnovation.com. Stay curious and keep learning. See you next time.